And the enemy will say, you have blown it, you're not good enough, or you did this, you sinned, you'll never, liar, he's a liar. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. If you don't know that, God's offering you his grace this morning to forgive you, make you brand new, wash you white as clean, so you come to Jesus today. And also, you may think, well, God can't use that person because you know something about them. Guess what? God forgives them too, not just you. So we're to forgive them. Put your hands together for our distinguished guest, my friend, Mr. Dan Betzer. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Pastor. Good morning, saints. Good morning, saints. You're saints. Good morning, saints. Absolutely covered by the blood of Jesus. The righteousness of Christ imputed to you. You're a saint. Boy, this is a good church. Do you know how good a church this is? I, I hope you don't ever take this for granted. This is a good church. And I love your pastor. Bless his old creaky heart. I, he's Man, he's just a great, this is wonderful. I'm an Iowa boy. I was born and raised in Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> Sioux City, first 16 years of my life in Sioux City and Climbing Hill. Anybody know where Climbing Hill, Iowa is? God bless you folks. You're on your way to heaven. <laughs> those, those, those two folks. My precious wife, we just had our 60th anniversary. She's here somewhere. Darlene, where are you? Stand up, honey. Stand up, honey. That's my bride. It's a long time, isn't it? 60 years. But she just keeps renewing my contract, so. Man, it's good to be back in Iowa. I love this state. Your city's beautiful. This church is gorgeous. And it's paid for? Whew. Wow. Well, I'm supposed to talk to you about missions, and that's the only thing I know to talk about. Missions is our passion. Emblazoned on both sides of our sanctuary, it says, reach, teach, send. That's all we do. Reach people, disciple them, send them out. Reach, teach, and send. We are in the redemption business. I'm not in the church business. I'm in the redemption business big difference. I'll tell you something, there aren't a whole lot of Assembly of God churches like you. I want to tell you that again. Hang on to what you have and let it grow. There aren't many like you. I will, I will be praying for you. I just love this church, Pastor. And you missionaries who are here, our church is going to pick each one of you up on a monthly basis. But you got to get me your commitment forms. You got to get me your commitment forms. Somebody said, I don't, I don't have it with me. What kind of a missionary doesn't carry commitment forms with them? <laughs> We're going to pick you up. We support about 485 or 90 missionaries a month. And we just go, man, I, I never say no to a missionary. Fort Myers, Florida is the lightning capital of the world. I'm not going to say no to a missionary. <laughs> Going to all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus said that. I know it's in the 16th chapter of Mark, and Mark's writing stopped at verse 9. I know that. It's bracketed, but it's still in the Bible. It's still part of the canon. Going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I wonder if he meant that. He said to his disciples, Acts 1.8, ye shall receive power. When the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was 13 over at Sioux City. Middle of the night, nobody in the church but me. Absolutely revolutionized my life. I believe that speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of the baptism, but it's not the baptism. It's the initial physical evidence of it. The baptism is an endowment of power. Jesus said so. You shall receive power. Changes the way you think. It gives you a vision for the world. You can't be Pentecostal 
and not have a world view. It's impossible. God so loved the? Oh, I thought it just said Des Moines there. God so loved the what? Go ye into all the? Got to have a world view. I really do love your pastor. I, I don't want to ride in a car with him anymore, but, but I, I knew him when he worked under the name of Mario Andretti. I, I love the way he thinks. There aren't many like him anymore. The baptism changes the way you think. We got down to Fort Myers 30 years ago to become the pastor of that church. Been there all these 30 years now. And um, for the first little while, we were in the church business. God's not in the church business. He's in the redemption business. That's what separates you people. You're in the redemption business. There's just an aura about you that's fabulous. You're in the redemption business. I was looking for a youth pastor 30 years ago. I met your youth pastors here this morning. They look wonderful. You know, the great, truly great youth pastors are only visiting this planet. They're from outer space, man, the good ones. So I was looking for a youth pastor, and the Lord laid a guy on my heart up in Atlanta, and I called him and said, would you be interested in coming? He said, I'd like to talk to you. And on the moment, I'd never seen the guy, never met him. I hired him. I just felt a thing in my heart, you know. <laughs> and a couple weeks later, he comes into my office, and I thought, dear God, what have you done to me here? This guy had hair everywhere. He is about the weirdest dude I ever met. He said, my name's Tommy, and I'm your new youth pastor. I thought, oh, dear God. My whole life's going in front of my eyes. He was incredible. See, I, I'm an old man. I don't think like a youth. But he thought like a youth, and he wanted to redeem people. Well, we had in our collection an old Sunday school bus, an old school bus that we'd turned into a you know, give God junk. That's what we try to do. So we had, we had this old school bus. And the motor worked okay, but the body was awful. It was an embarrassment. Nobody, nobody would ride in that bus. So Tommy comes to me one day and he said, Pastor, would you let the young people have the bus and could we paint it? I said, yeah. Now remember, I'm thinking as an old guy, I'm thinking body shop. Fill in, sand. Two hours later, he comes back and said, do you want to see it? <laughs> I said, yeah, go have it done. I want it. No, he said, it's all done. I said, excuse me? He said, it's done. We're all done with you. You want to see it? I said, no. I don't want to see it. And I said, come on out. So I go out in the parking lot, and here's this bus. A bunch of young people there with buckets of paint and paint brushes, painting it. And they got a deal somewhere on the most ghastly yellow paint I have ever seen. Just, they painted the tires, and they painted the wheels, and they painted the grill. And then it was latex, so it dried pretty quick. And then they took some black paint, and they painted a stripe about midway down the bus. They painted a stripe all the way around it, then they left about that much yellow, and they painted another stripe, and then a little bit more yellow, and the whole back end of the bus is painted black. It looked like a bee from hell. <laughs> he said, you want to see the back of the bus? I said, no, man, I really don't. He said, come here. And that, that was the year the first Batman movie came out. And they had painted the Batman logo from one taillight to the other. And over the windshield, they had painted the word Bumble Bat. My blood ran cold. 
I said, do you have any more of that paint? He said, yeah. Well, I said, I want you to paint right here on the hood that's yellow. I want you to paint McGregor Baptist Church. <laughs> See, I was in the church business. Tommy's in the redemption business. We couldn't get anybody in that bus before. I'm almost always the first person in the church on Sunday morning. The phones start ringing. Uh, what time does the bumble bat come through our neighborhood? <laughs> See, the baptism just changes the way you think. What happens is what you read about in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Faith, faith, which is not only a fruit of the Spirit, but it's a gift of the Spirit, according to Galatians and Corinthians. Faith is substance. It's not the warm fuzzies. It's not positive thinking. It's not positive confession. None of that fairy tale stuff. Faith is substance. You can stand on it. It is as solid as a rock because it's built on the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing what? The Word of God. The more of the Bible you know, the more faith you'll have. Faith is substance of what things hoped for. You got a good crowd here today. I used to be an evangelist. What do we have here? 12,000 people? <laughs> I don't know. But in this gorgeous town, you have what? Hundreds of thousands of people. The Bible says, does it not, several times, God is not willing that anybody perish. Think all around you. This is great here this morning, but God's not willing that anybody perish. There has to be a way to reach them. So did you ever think faith is the substance of things hoped for? What if we had 30,000 people in church? My friend David Mohan is from India, native of India. Two Sundays ago, we had 80,000 people in church. 80,000 people. Well, that must be a big building. Yeah, it really is. It's on one acre of land. They just have service after service after service after service after service. About 12 of them, 80,000 people. Faith. Changes the way you think. Everything about you is different. I'm blessed with a wonderful staff. I tell pastors, don't hire anybody that's not smarter than you are. If they're not smarter than you are, why do you need them? <laughs> I didn't heckle you, fellow, when you... <laughs> I love that man. We meet on Monday morning. So back in 1998, Easter, we had the first time we ever had 2,000 people in church. So Monday, I'm just full of vigor. I said, next Easter, let's have 5,000 people. They said, that's great. How are we going to do that? I said, I don't know. It's pastors are supposed to get the idea. <laughs> See? And then you all pull it off. See, that's the deal. I said, I don't know. Then one of the guys said, where are we going to put them? We only see 2,000 people in the sanctuary. Where are we going to put them? I don't know. Well, one, of the, one of the staff said, you know, the Minnesota Twins have spring training down in Fort Myers. So did the Boston Red Sox. And the Twins had just built a gorgeous new spring training stadium that would seat 8,000 people. Beautiful. Somebody said, let's see if we can't rent the stadium for Easter Sunday. Yeah, right. So I picked up the phone and I called. I'd like to talk to whoever's in charge of the Twin Stadium. Hello. Well, I'm Pastor Betzer. Would it be possible for First Assembly to rent the stadium next Easter Sunday for church? We need it all day Saturday for rehearsals. 
We need a rehearsal that night, so all the lights have to be on. And we need three of the other practice diamonds to set up tents for youth, for a children's church and so forth. He said, you want what? He said, never heard that before. I said, could, could we rent it? He said, I'll call you back. You have not because you ask not. So about an hour later, this guy calls me back and he said, yeah, we'll, we'll rent you the stadium. I said, how much? He said, $100. I said, excuse me? He said, 100 bucks. I said, to rent the whole thing? He said, yeah, we want to help you out, 100 bucks. I said, could we, could we rent it every Sunday? <laughs> well, we'd have been moving out of our church, I'll tell you what. He said, no, but you can have it Sunday. So now we got the stadium, how are we going to fill it? So one of the guys said, let's bring down Convoy of Hope. And they'll bring in 25 tons of non-perishable food. And let's add 50 tons of perishable food. We'll spend all day Saturday boxing it up so the people, they don't just get a little bag. They get a trunk full of food. A lot of hungry people. Well, somebody else said, that's great, but how are they going to get here? They got no way to get here. So one of the guys said, well, see how this starts to work. You start to think differently. One of the guys said, let's call the city bus transportation system and see if on Easter Sunday they won't run every route by the stadium. Ah, they're not going to do that. You know, that's how we think. They said, yeah, we'd be happy to do that. So now we got the city bus transportation system there. We bring in a video crew. Sound is always crucial in a place like that. So there was a big rock and roll group uh, in town. And I said, will you set up your sound system? Massive. The sound system. They said, yeah. So there we are. Then the guy from the twins called me back. I thought, ooh. He said, listen, do you have any of your young people who could sing? We have a game at 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon, so you got to have the infield clear. Do you have one of your young people who could sing the national anthem? I said, yeah. He said, oh, one more thing. He said, you know anybody in your church who could throw out the first pitch? I said, I don't know if your catcher can handle it, but uh, <laughs> seven and a half thousand people show up. And the church just took off. Where there's no vision, people die. People die. And there has to be a vision for the foreign field has to be. How many churches you reckon you have in Des Moines? 500? Bet you do, more than that. They may not all preach the gospel, but you have that many churches. In our little town of Fort Myers, we have 340 churches. I'm worried about this trap door up here. We have 340 churches. Springfield, Missouri, our headquarters town, the county has 75 Assemblies of God churches. Dear God, how many churches do they need? There are cities around the world of a million people that don't have any. They have no, no church, no Christian radio station, no Christian publishing plant, no Christian television, no anything. How are they going to believe in somebody they've never heard of? What makes us special? What makes us think we should hear the gospel over and over and over and over? How many times do you reckon you've heard the gospel? I calculated in my own life I've heard it at least 20,000 times. 20,000 times. Do you think that's fair? Somebody in Siberia today, cities over there of a million people, there's no gospel church anywhere. Do you think that's fair? Do you think that's right? Why, why should you and I 
have the right to hear the gospel over and over and over and over. In your town of Des Moines, this beautiful city, if somebody wants to hear the gospel, dear God, it's everywhere. In our little old town of Fort Myers, we have several Christian radio stations. We have a Christian television station. We have churches. If you want to hear the gospel down there, you got access to it. But in many of the cities of the world, you're going to hell. Sorry, pal. You think that's right? I hear it over and over again. Well, we just need to reach our own town. It's being reached, but so many cities don't even have a drop. How many of you would consider yourself to be Pentecostal? Hold up your hand. You're Pentecostal. Well, well, let's see. Acts chapter 2, they, the 120 believers there in Jerusalem, they were all with one accord in one place. They were in John Mark's mother's house there on Mount Zion. They're all with one place in one accord. Suddenly, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Didn't say it was a rushing mighty wind. Said it sounded like one. Filled all the house where they were. Isn't that hard for Pentecostal people to say that word? Sitting. We have to stand. I've had people in music say, well, you can't sing this sitting down. Watch me. I'm an old man. I'm 80 years old. I have a firm belief in sitting, sitting. All the house where they were. The Holy Spirit was poured out in a church where they were. If you want to have revival, sit down. <laughs> Suddenly there appeared unto each of them tongues of fire. Split fire fell on each of them. I was never replicated again in the book of Acts. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit, whom we love so passionately, fell on the day of Pentecost, which was the annual Jewish day of harvest. Do you think that's coincidental? The Holy Spirit was poured out to implement the harvest. I'm Pentecostal, Brother Betzer. Good. Are you a harvester? Well, no, not, then you're not Pentecostal. Pentecostal means harvest reaching the lost at home and around the world. Jesus said, ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come on you, and ye shall be my witnesses. And here the Holy Spirit changes the way you think. It just, most churches, even Pentecostal churches, think in a little box about like that, you know. Well, I've never done that before. No, we've just never done it, period. Fort Myers is a tourist town, so we have a lot of adult nightclubs there. So a new one opened up, and uh, I got a call from one of the local pastors. He said, you heard about the new adult nightclub? That just means where dancers dance, can't afford clothes, you know. <laughs> so he said, you heard? I said, yeah, I've heard about it. He said, well, tonight some of us are going to meet there, a bunch of churches, and we got these placards, close this place down, close this, and we're going to march around this nightclub, and we know that First Assembly would like to join us. I said, no, we wouldn't. That's not the brightest thing you've ever said. Well, what do you mean it's not bright? I said, well, you march around that club tonight. Who's going to be there? I promise you the local television news will be there. Promise you. And at 6 o'clock tonight on the newscast, there you're going to be marching around places called babes. <laughs> marching around babes. And out in the television audience is some old drunk sitting there in his rocker nursing a Budweiser. He said, well, look at there. I didn't even know that place existed until the First Assembly showed me. <laughs> so we're not going to do that. But there has to be a way to reach them. You ever stop to think about that? 
God's not willing that those dancers, those bouncers, those bartenders be lost. Got to be a way to reach them. So one Sunday morning, a lady came and sat in the back of the church. Her name was Jeannie, Jeannie Turner. She had been married five times, and she was living with a guy she wasn't married to. She's our woman of Samaria. She got radically saved, radically saved. Several months later, she came to me with our lady's pastor, and she said, I have an idea to reach the people in those nightclubs. Really? Now, this is a women's ministry, guys. This is not a men's ministry. You stay out of there or God will strike you dead. She said, this is what I feel God wants us to do. We, all week long, we have a prayer chain for one specific club. And on Friday night, the big night, she said, I'll go in with several of the ladies with a beautifully wrapped gift. And I'll ask the Holy Spirit to choose one of those dancers at one of those poles up there. And I'll go right up on the stage and give her a gift. I said, it's never been done before. So the first Friday night, they'd saturated that place with prayer. Jeannie said, I walked into the lobby. It is as decadent as you could possibly imagine. And the Lord pointed out one lady up there dancing around one of those poles. Her name happened to be Melissa. And she walked up to the lady and she said, hi, my name's Jeannie. What's your name? Oh, my name's Melissa. Hi, Melissa. This gift is for you. Why would you give a gift to me? Uh, because I love you. But Melissa, Jesus loves you more. Melissa dropped to the floor like she had been shot. She began to sob. She said, are you an angel? Jeannie said, for goodness sakes, no, I'm not an angel. Why do you ask that? She said, because, Jeannie, this afternoon I prayed for the first time in my life. God, if you even exist, I can't take this anymore. And unless something happens, like you send me an angel, I'm coming home tonight and take my life. Are you an angel? Jeannie said, I guess for you I am. And on the spot led Melissa to the Lord. She became one of our bus captains for years until she moved. Over the years, Jeannie and those ladies have led over 150 of those dancers to the Lord. They're not coming to us. They're not coming to us. The sinners aren't coming to us. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Jesus said he went to where the man was. That's what these folks from China are doing. Well, what good does it do to send a missionary to China anyway? Oh, really? I'm glad you asked that. The most evil leader in my lifetime, unquestionably, was Mao Zedong of China. Historians estimate he killed 60 million people. Demonic killed missionaries when they swept into China in the late 40s. They butchered people right and left. He was a killer, a butcher. Mao Zedong. Last fall, I introduced a guest in our pulpit. That guest was Mao Zedong's grandson preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel. Do you know how powerful it is? I go into death row in Florida. There's 407 guys waiting for the needle on death row. It is it is evil. I, my skin crawls when I walk in there. These guys live 
in seven by nine foot cages in a non air conditioned building in Florida. The hatred, the anger, the poison. But the gospel changes them. But how can people believe unless they hear? How can they hear? Unless these folks go tell them. And how can they go tell them unless you send them? That's what the book of Romans says. Your pastor said that you have cards called faith promise cards. I'm going to ask you to take them out, please, out of your bulletin. Everyone should have one, and there will be ushers going up and down the aisles. If you don't have a card, please hold up your hand. If you don't have a card and you don't hold up your hand, you'll get warts all over your body. (sighs) This is the standard Assembly of God card. This is not money for me. I don't want your money. This is for missions. This is not a pledge. Yeah, raise your hand high. This is not a pledge. Hear me. This is not a pledge. I haven't taken time to go through this this morning. But a pledge is what you can do out of your budget, which is probably shot. So don't feel any tension here. This is what God will do through you. That's why it's called a faith promise. A faith promise. God makes you a conduit a channel through whom he pours resources. I've seen this down at First Assembly in Fort Myers through the years. It takes my breath away. It just takes my breath away. You already have a great reputation for missions giving, but is that supernatural? A faith promise offering is a supernatural one. We sing, how great thou art. My God is an awesome God. Really? What if you prayed, oh God, in the next year, pour through me funding. I'm not going to use it to get a better car or whatever it is. I happen to love cars passionately. I drive a six-year-old Toyota. And I'll say to my precious wife, oh, did you see this new car? Let's go get one. She'll say, okay. Okay. They don't need to hear the gospel in China. (laughs) So I got a six-year-old car. I don't care about that. This is not giving to get either. This is giving in obedience to the Great Commission. And God will do something in your life. He will make you a channel. If you write something down on that card, and you really feel pretty good about it, God probably didn't have much to do with it because what God tells you to write scare you. I was preaching in one of our big cities and giving a commitment just like this, and I, the Holy Spirit began to move on that crowd. I saw people run to the altar sobbing, oh, God, forgive us for not supporting missions. And I was sitting next to the pastor, and his wife came over. And she said, honey, God just spoke to me while Dan was speaking. We're supposed to give $10,000 tonight. He said, (laughs) okay. And he turned to me and he said, Betzer, you will never preach in this church again. (laughs) Heavenly Father, Would you do something supernatural, something transcendent in this house today? This is a great church. Thank you for it. Thank you for the pastor and the staff. I thank you for what you do through these people in this state that I love so desperately. Would would it be possible, Lord... Would it be possible, Lord, for you to do something in this congregation? 
that would be earth-shaking. What happened on the day of Pentecost was earth-shaking. Would something happen here today, Lord, that would rescue the perishing and care for the dying? Would you let the faith which is already strong here. But would you increase it a hundredfold, a thousandfold here today? And people would start to think, Lord, you're talking to my heart. In the next 12 months, you want to do something through me that I really don't think is possible, but this is a faith promise. Would you help me to make that commitment and then seek your face to make it happen? You are the source, not I. Thank you. Thank you for your presence here today. You're wonderful. Amen.